For children, it won't seem like much of an innovation, but we adults aren't quite as imaginative. So battery-operated trains have finally transitioned from toys into real-world transportation. Then we have a proper transformer, a glider hydrofoil boat that can float, skim over water and even fly on a cushion of air. Finally, we have those magnificent men in their solar-powered machines racing across the desert. Have a look. Mobility has always been at the heart of human progress. From the invention of the wheel to aircraft soaring through the sky. Each one of these innovations has reshaped how we connect, trade and explore. Today, that journey is entering a bold new chapter. Electric power and advanced engineering are driving innovations once thought impossible. The future of mobility isn't just about how fast we go, but how we can move with the planet and not against it. Railways have long driven the evolution of human mobility. They carried industries, shaped cities and connected people. Shrinking distances and bringing us closer than ever before. Now, as the world shifts towards cleaner energy, railways are again becoming a testing ground for innovation. In the United Kingdom, that innovation has just set a new world record for the longest distance travelled by a battery-powered train on a single charge. Today, uh, we've broken uh, the record for the longest distance travelled on a single charge by a battery train. We've done just over 200 miles uh, and that's broken the record by quite some distance overnight. Uh, it's an important achievement uh, for the UK rail industry to be able to do that uh, because it demonstrates the viability of battery technology to power trains in the future. Equipped with six high-capacity battery packs, the train ran at an average speed of 35 to 38 miles per hour. Even at the end of its epic journey, the train's battery still held more than 22% of its charge, which was just enough to cover another 60 miles if needed. To push the train to its record-breaking 200-mile target, engineers had to conserve every single electron. Non-essential systems were cut back, ensuring maximum power was reserved for traction. So to, to make sure that we achieve the, the target, which was to break the record and stretch that to 200 miles, um, we had to make sure that the auxiliary loads, uh, so the, the things that use energy that are not just driving the train along, uh, were kept to a bare minimum. And we need to understand what, well, what is the bare minimum and what does that mean? Is it Because we would have questions like, well, can, can we have laptop, laptops on uh, and does that make a difference? Does the lighting make a difference? All that sort of stuff. This record-breaking run isn't just a milestone in distance. It's a turning point for the entire rail industry proving that battery technology can power long journeys reliably and efficiently. Australia recently hosted the 2025 edition of the Bridgestone World Solar Challenge. The 3,000-kilometre event from Darwin in Australia's north to Adelaide in the south is one of the most prestigious solar car races in the world. Innovation challenges like this are historically a really important way to push the bleeding edges of technology sets. You know, there's all sorts of races throughout time that have been used to do that. And this Bridgestone World Solar Challenge for 40 years now has been iterating and evolving electric mobility in the first instance, you know, just riding on electricity rather than internal combustion engine technology and tapping sunshine direct, you know, using solar power in all sorts of new ways at better efficiency and effectively they've turned the Sturt Highway into a 3,000 kilometre sandbox to just create new, better, faster ways of driving on sunshine. 34 cars representing 17 countries participated in the race. They were divided into three categories. The Challenger class featured speed-focused, single-seaters built for endurance and efficiency. The Cruiser class showcased multi-seat vehicles designed with practicality in mind. And the Explorer class opened doors for experimental designs that pushed the boundaries of solar technology. It's important to 
improve the cars we've got because for about a hundred years we really haven't upgraded them. You know, they've been blowing up petrol and turning pistons and this kind of crazy old school infernal combustion engine, which we also have learnt more lately in the late 20th century is causing global warming. We've got to get off and just do better. This year's race was nicknamed the Battle of the Finns, a testament to the new fin technology used by the teams to gain an edge in stability, aerodynamics and speed. I bet you in 10 years time we'll all be taking it for granted that the cars coming out have, you know, weird little foils and things that, you know, you're wondering how they came up with that. Well, here you go. This is how they came up with it. It was tested by these teams on this trip, on this track at this time. Held once every two years, the race showcases the future of transportation where solar-powered cars might one day become the norm on our city streets. It's not just the land, the sea is also witnessing a quiet revolution of its own. Gliding just above the waves of Narragansett Bay in Massachusetts is a vessel straight out of the future. The Paladin better known as the Sea Glider. The part boat, part aircraft vessel promises to cut down the journey from Rhode Island to New York City to under an hour, a route that usually takes at least three hours by train and even longer on traffic-clogged freeways. A Sea Glider is an all-electric flying boat. It is meant for regional coastal transportation to solve the problems of routes that are just too long to drive and you're stuck in traffic, or to fly where it's too expensive and you're stuck in the airport longer than you're in the airplane. A Sea Glider operates in three modes, float, foil, and fly. So you board it at the dock like a boat, then you rise up on hydrofoils that we take from the America's Cup, so that gives us high wave tolerance in the harbor, and then we fly on a cushion of air over the surface of the water, just like a bird flies on. Powered by electricity, the Sea Glider's 65-foot wingspan is equipped with 12 humming propellers. These propellers help it float, foil, and eventually fly. The vessel is lifted by a phenomenon known as ground effect, allowing it to skim a cushion of air just a few meters above the sea. And so by compressing that air under the wings, between the wing and the water, sea gliders, low-flying birds, anything that flies low, gets this tremendous lift augmentation, this flight boost to give us long range and very efficient travel. During a recent trial, a prototype named Viceroy demonstrated the sea glider's three modes of movement. It began like a boat at the dock, then rose on hydrofoils, before seamlessly transitioning into flight mode at speeds of up to 180 miles per hour. So right now when seaplanes and flying boats try to take off from the water, they're slapping the surface of the water, they have very poor wave tolerance, and that's why they're constrained to inland waterways, lakes and rivers. Sea gliders, by contrast, have a hydrofoil. That's an underwater wing. We're taking that from the sailing world, the racing world, America's Cup and Sail GP. These underwater wings called hydrofoils lift the sea glider out of the surface of the water, giving us five feet of wave tolerance. So that's basically a hurricane, allowing us to accelerate up to about 50 to 60 miles an hour before we take off on the wing. More than being just a vessel, the Sea Glider represents a vision for coastal mobility where the ocean is no longer a barrier but an open highway.